6 p.m. is senior choir practice. It says, please contact Denise if you have any special music to share. The 10th is J2O practice, and the 11th is Hanukkah for any of our Jewish friends. <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Sunday the 12th will be a worship service with special music. I would imagine Christmas music. <coughs> I don't know what just says here. Special worship with special music for the 13th. Okay. <laughs> I'm surprised at her this morning. Okay. Okay. other things on the back here. Sunday the 19th from 10 to noon, uh, the Sunday school teachers annual party for the children and the last practice before the children's program on the 20th. Shelter in the storm ministry. Uh, Sandy Rumble is chair of the emergency preparedness ministry. Uh, the focus now is getting blow up twin size mattresses. Uh, it says we have performed in-house test on the Ozark Trail mattress. They are available at Walmart for $8, so if anybody's interested in purchasing some of those for church needs. Second Sunday in Advent is the time where John the Baptist's voice is heard most clearly. We do not need to look further than him for the example of what it means to serve the Lord in a vigilant anticipation. In the Gospel reading, John fulfills Isaiah's prophecy of the messenger who goes ahead to prepare the Lord's way. It means making rough places smooth, filling valleys, and raising hills to make a level place. Okay, January 7th will be a financial peace uh, ministry. I don't believe that's all. Oh, the Christmas tree. The Christmas tree over here has been donated by the Jeff Hill family in memory of the grandparents, Herb and Helen, Father Charles and his son, Matt. Are there any other announcements this morning? Mary? It has, it has listed that the Women's Guild will be meeting uh, on Monday, but that's been canceled. I'm sorry, I missed that, Terry. Oh, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> Anything else this morning? Oh, sure. Morning. Sure. Okay. Oh, okay, so um, I am hosting a financial peace class again in January. It's going to be on Thursdays. And um, last year, uh, we had several people here in the church join it, and um, everyone seems to really enjoy it. Everyone who finished um, said that by the end of the class, they actually earned more than the results than the class they paid. So this year, the cost is $129.99. However, uh, we have had church money, not church money, we have had money donated by some of our church members to uh, pay for part of the class. So if you complete eight out of the nine classes, um, a certain amount of money will be given back to you um, for completing it. That money is kind of going to be decided exactly on how many members you have. But um, definitely encourage everyone to look into it. I know that last year uh, everyone seemed to find information that they hadn't heard before and uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about it more. We also have um, a virtual class that's going to take place as well as an uh, in-person class. As long as we're able to meet in person due to you know, the COVID restrictions and everything, I'd like to have one class in person. But on Tuesdays, I will be having an online class as well. Thank you. Then you want to play the video? Oh, yes, please. Yes. Okay. A video. Financial peace. We all want it. For a while, I didn't have it. Twenty years ago, I hit rock bottom. I lost just about everything. I turned to God for help and I learned how to handle money his way. As you can imagine, it worked. That's why I started Financial Peace University. 
because God's ways work. Whether you're in over your head or you're doing okay right now, if you bring home $10,000 or $10 million, if you're 21 or 61, we all need a plan. Millions of people have been through Financial Peace University. They have success stories of their own. They've learned how to get rid of debt, prepare for generations to come, and give like crazy. Your success story, your financial peace is up to you. Now is your time. It's time to take control of your money. It's time to get ready for what God has for you. It's time for financial peace. Next Sunday after uh, church, uh, Circle of Friends will be making cookies this week, so we hope we can sell a whole bunch of them. <laughs> so, uh, plan on that then. I guess we'll be downstairs. Well, you said Tuesday, what time? I can't talk so much. Okay. So, yeah, we'll be making cookies Tuesday starting at 11. Today's the last day for the poinsettia orders. Um, you can either give them to me or there is a green folder if you want a limited contact uh, option out on out by the first of the month offering. Um, I don't need the payment until next week, so if you forgot your checkbook but you wanted to order poinsettias, please put the order form in today. I, I just want to let everyone know that we collected 27 shoe boxes, and if you pay online, people are starting to see where their boxes went. Um, I think Susan Markavich's family went to Dominican Republic, and um, I know one year Jess. Philippines, she got not ours, but they get Operation Christmas Child as well. And also, I wanted to let everyone know that we served around 65 families at the soup kitchen, and we have a few eggs left over. So, on your way out, we'll have eggs there if anyone needs any to take home. Thank you. Anything else today? And we'll continue with our service.
the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. What's wrong? I'm worried about how this world is changing so rapidly. I'm worried how it will affect my kids' life and the experiences they will have. Worried about myself or loved ones catching a virus. Worried we will completely shut down again and not be able to do things like meet to worship God. Worried about losing my job. Some family members that live nearby I haven't seen for almost a year. They might as well live, be living in another country. I'm getting so depressed that nothing will ever be the same again. I understand, and I do feel the same way too. Remember, I'm sure that Mary and Joseph were very scared and worried as they took their trip to Bethlehem. She was very pregnant, and I'm sure they had a lot of what ifs. God got them through it, and he'll get us through this as well. We just need to keep praying. Remember that all things work out for good for those who love him. Even in death we are victorious because of Jesus. I know you're right. That makes me think of this week's Advent candle. It symbolizes faith and is the Bethlehem candle. We will try to focus on our faith in Jesus and stop worrying about the future. We'll put more faith in God and he will pave a way for our family, just like he did for Mary and Joseph. say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So together, let's confess our sins before Almighty God. Father God, we come together this morning hearing John the Baptist cry for them, for your kingdom is at hand. We confess how easy it is for us to say we are sorry when we have no intention of turning away from our sin. We have more in common with the brood of vipers than with your saints. Forgive us, Father. Deliver us from these bodies of death. Restore us to our undeserved place as your humble servants. For we pray in the name of the one who makes it possible, Jesus the Christ. Amen. <laughs> I lost her for a moment. <laughs>
And when my son was diagnosed, I was devastated. But this song came out, and it gave me so much hope that even if he isn't cured in this earth, that God has cured him already. So this song is very special to me, and uh, thank you.
think uh, all, of us, all of us can relate to that song in, in some measure. The scripture lesson today is from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8, as found on page 1,555 in your pew Bible. Prepare your hearts for the reading of God's holy word. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clo clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I am, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May the Lord grant you blessing to the reading and to the hearing of it. bow our heads as we pray together. Father God, we thank you that you've made it possible for us to be here this morning because, Father God, we know that corporate worship is crucial to our Christian walk, and we thank you that we have not let Satan get in the way of that. We praise you, Lord God. But, Father, we are mindful of so many in our culture who are so frightened, and for good reason, Father God. But we pray, Lord, that their faith and trust in you would rise above their fear, and that they would move ahead with their lives, Father God, regardless of the consequences. We know, Father God, that historically it's never been easy to be a Christian, and we know that it isn't easy now whether it be a pandemic or whether it be an overreaching government, regardless, Father. And we pray, Lord, that when people look at us, that they would see people who trust you. We pray, Father, for the people in this sanctuary, Lord, that you would put a hedge of protection around us and that you would keep us safe. But we know that we all must move about, Lord God, and we know that in this situation, probably all of us are gonna get this disease some way. We pray, Lord God, that we would weather the storm well, that we would come out on the other side stronger, and Lord, we know some will die. And we pray, Father God, if it is us, that we would die well and for your glory. Because, Father, we know that all of us are just passing through, and none of us knows, Father, the number of our days. So, Father, we just pray for this whole situation as we intercede for those who we bring before your throne. We pray for the Berkey family, somehow, Father, who came down with COVID. We pray for them all. We pray for Amy's mom in the hospital. We pray for Jess, Lord, and all of her friends at that base in Butuan, Lord, and especially now that they're getting ready to move, Lord, that, that you would make every you would open every door and make every hill level. We pray for our dear brother Harold, Luann, Barb, and Cindy. We pray for Greg's continued healing. And Lord, even though we were praying for Bob before for other things, we pray for the family now. We thank you for Janet, that she's getting well, Lord, and, and we pray for the family and the friends of Clint. And we especially pray for Johnny, who will be bringing the message this afternoon at Clint's funeral. Lord, it's death out of season. And we pray, Father, that you would give him just the words to say to bring comfort to those people who are wondering why and those people who are grieving. We pray for our church family who care, who care for COVID patients, Lord, and put themselves in harm's way. And Lord, we do pray that you would put that bubble of protection around us all within these walls. And Lord, we lift up today these whom we speak out in agreement before your throne. Yes, 
Yes, Father. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. We pray, Father God, for the persecuted church, for those who are suffering for the cause of your Son. We pray, Lord, during the season of Advent that you would draw wayward souls back to you. We pray for our country. We pray for our leaders. Father, we pray for our community. And we pray, Father God, for this, our church family and the families within it, Lord, and especially prodigal children. But Father God, we pray it all knowing that you've never let us down in the past. And we know you're not going to start now. Your timing is not always our timing, but it is the best timing. So Lord, we pray that you would hear that trust and love that we have for you in our hearts. As together we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray when he walked with us here on earth the first time. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear our prayer. Continue our worship with our offering.
use some of what you have given to us. And Lord, we know that the greater offering is our lives in service to you. And so, Lord, we pray that we would repent, and that we prepare our hearts for the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, and that we would help others along the way as well. We pray all this in the name of the one that we follow, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, children's sermon time. Let me ask you a question this morning. How many kids are in here? All right. When your parents are driving their cars, how do they know about stuff coming up that might be important to them? What, te- what on the road tells them what's coming up, what's important? Anybody know? Signs. Signs, perfect. Yep, it's road signs. All around the world there are road signs that tell us or warn us about what's coming up. Uh, we're going to show you a few of them. You ready, Charlotte? Whoop. What is that? <laughs> it's a sign. It's a sign. <laughs> what happened, Charlotte? <laughs> Try to click on it again and bring it back down. I'm it. <laughs> okay. Never mind. We will do without the signs. All right. Well, there were some funny road signs. Believe me, they were pretty funny. Um, our scripture lesson today is about... Oh, wait, what was that? I'm <laughs> <laughs> It's all right. Oh, there's one. Well, you saw that one. The roads, the road closed, then there was a... It was flooded with water. Um, uh, it's all right. We'll just move on with that one. I only spent half an hour getting that together. (laughs) (laughs) All right. (laughs) So our scripture lesson today is about John the Baptist, the man who went around telling the people to get ready for something. Now, although, you know, we have road signs now that tell us about what's coming up in the road to get ready for a turn or, um, you know, moose crossing, deer crossing, things like that. Um, you know, they did have kind of like road signs back then, but they weren't the shiny metal kind of things that we have now. But if you think about it, John the Baptist was kind of like a road sign to the people of the time, telling them about what was coming up in their lives and warning them to get ready for it. John wore rough, probably smelly clothing made out of camel hair, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And I bet people thought that he was pretty weird. But they probably also also thought that he was pretty cool, too, because they kept coming to him to be baptized by him in the Jordan River and to hear what he had to say. And he said that someone was coming who was way cooler than he was, someone whose sandals John wasn't even worthy to touch, someone who would baptize them with the Holy Spirit instead of just water. And who was that someone that Jesus was telling them about? Who do you think that was? Who? Who? Who was, who was John telling people that, warning people that they, that was coming? Jesus, right? It was Jesus. So today, boys and girls, we are reminded that Christmas is coming, the celebration of the birth of Jesus. So let's get ready for Christmas. And I don't mean decorating our houses or you know, getting a Christmas tree, although that's all good. There's nothing wrong with that. But I mean preparing spiritually to get ready to welcome Jesus into our lives this Christmas and to share his love with everyone we know and everyone we meet. So let's pray about that. Father God, we thank you for the signs that tell us that Jesus is coming. We thank you that John the Baptist was there to tell the people at at his time, Lord. We pray that we would be part of that, telling people about Jesus and pointing them to him. We pray all this in the name of the one that we follow, Jesus the Christ. Amen.
Testament, how you get to Bethlehem, and they all will say the same thing. You go out into the desert, you keep going until you hit the River Jordan. You can't miss it because there's going to be a man there standing knee-deep in the water, and he's going to be baptizing people. And that's John the Baptizer. And you ask him, uh, if you want to go to Bethlehem, you've got to start there. There is no other way to get there. They all say the same things, all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all say that if you want to go to Bethlehem, and at this time of year, who doesn't? They all say that if you want to go to Bethlehem, you have got to start with John the Baptist. Our Gospel lesson this morning are the first words in the Gospel of Mark. The beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's the way Mark begins his gospel. Mark doesn't say a word about Bethlehem. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but Mark doesn't have a birth narrative at all. He never mentions it, but he still starts with John. At the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, according to Mark, there is John the Baptist, because you have to start someplace. All the Gospels say you must start with John the Baptist. Even those gospel stories that don't record the Christmas stories, Mark and John, they begin with John the Baptist. The Gospel of John begins with these beautiful words. We share them every Christmas Eve. I love these words. I've got the best seat in the house because you all are carrying candles. And it's, oh. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. John uses these beautiful words to paint this, this pastoral scene for us in our minds. John was very Greek, and his language was meant to paint mental pictures. That's what the language of Greek of, that spoken in Greece did. The Greek term we translate word really means the whole principle of creation. Okay, so a different way to say that would be like the power, uh, the power that created all things. So, in the beginning was the power that created all things. It doesn't have quite the same ring to it, but, but we get the picture, right? The Holy Spirit, through this very, very sophisticated Greek John, he, he begins with, just like all the others, with John the Baptist, the Jewish prophet, the man who ate locusts and wild honey, all dressed in animal skins, and Mark was right, Pastor Mark, he probably stank. Five verses in to this highbrow gospel about the divinity of Christ, and there he is. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. You can't get away from him. That's just the reality of it. If you want to go to Bethlehem, and we all do this time of year, you have to start your journey with John the Baptist. Now I know what you're thinking. It looks like Matthew might be the exception. Because Matthew begins with the birth of uh, story of Jesus. Matthew waits until the third chapter before he introduces John the Baptist. You know, I don't know, maybe he got carried away telling the wonderful stories about Joseph and his dreams. I don't know, visited the wise men, that's good stuff. I don't know, but there is no mention of John for the first two chapters. It appears that in Matthew, I don't know, maybe you can sneak your way into Bethlehem and back out without have, having to go through the baptizer. I'm not sure. But not quite, because out of nowhere, there he is, start of the third chapter, just as you're leaving the stable of Bethlehem, John's waiting to intercept you. He's all kicked back, he's leaned against a fence, and he's intercepting you as you walk out the door. He's a little late, but he's there, no denying it. Third chapter of Matthew begins with, in those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, repent. The kingdom of heaven is near. He is always there in all of the Gospels. He is right there at the beginning. And the Gentile Luke, who gives us our very our most familiar 
uh, and most popular of the Christmas stories. I mean, who doesn't love Luke this time of year? But get this, Luke begins his gospel not with a story about the birth of Jesus, but with a fully developed story about the birth of John the Baptist. What's more, Luke gives us some information that we need to know. And that is that Elizabeth, John's mother, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, were cousins. And, and he said they got together when they were pregnant. Uh, he, that they sang together, that they, they shared stories, they talked, they prayed together. And they wanted to know, you know, they were just kind of bouncing off of each other what all of this meant. And they did that for a whole six months. I'm just going to throw this out to you. Instead of relying on television specials, Hallmark movies, and Facebook advertisements to tell us what Christmas is about, and instead of those things, if we turn to our Bibles, we would find out that John the Baptist has a very, very big role to play in what Christmas is all about. John's there in every story, out in the desert, standing in the River Jordan, telling us how to get to Bethlehem from wherever it is that we are. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to go there. I don't want to go out there and see John. I, I've been there before. And uh, I know what he's going to say. And uh, I know that because he only ever says one thing, because he's like a broken record. And you know what his one sermon is, right? <laughs> Repent. He doesn't tell any jokes, doesn't tell any personal antidotes. You can hear him before you see him, and you can hear him hollering repent as it's echoing off the bar barren landscape. People don't, I don't, always like to hear that. I'm just going to confess that to you right now. Now you see, John is a prophet. Some people think a prophet is one who can foretell the future, and that's probably because prophecy in English refers to predicting the future. And that, I suppose, would be a part of what prophets do. And that part is the easy part to take. We all like that part. What is the hard part to take is when prophets start talking about the present. And that's what they all do. What they say about the present is repent. And that means change. Change your attitude. Ask God to change your heart. Ask God to change your direction. True and honest repentance is visible on the outside. True and honest repentance is something that other people can see. Prophets rarely say anything new. They rarely disclose any new information. They tell you what you already know, but you don't want to be reminded of. And they tell you what you don't want to face. And another thing about prophets, they are never politically correct. They never say the right thing. They never tell people what they want to hear. And they don't give a rip if you are offended. All of the biblical prophets were like that. And they all suffered for it, including John. John went to Herod the king. He thought he was liberated from the laws of common decency. King Herod had committed adultery, incest, murder, and God knows what else, whatever you see on the morning's news. John went and told Herod, you get your act together, you reprobate, because your lifestyle is going to destroy a whole nation. Because, you see, the Jews viewed morality as serious business. And not only that, it wasn't private business. What you did was not your own business, even if you were a king or a queen. There was a great sense of how what you did or didn't do offended and affected other people. Not offended, affected other people. And the same is true today. What we do or what we don't do is either going to bless or it's going to hurt someone else. That is just the reality of life. That is why sin is sin. We do not live in bubbles. Our culture is not made up of autonomous individuals, each one doing his or her own thing. 
That's not how life works. Life is not like a circus that is filled with different acts and performers that one has nothing to do with the other. Life is an expedition. It's like going on a long journey. It's a pilgrimage. It's like climbing a mountain, and whether you like it or not, we are all tied together. <laughs> and I know in a culture that values individualism, that sounds very offensive, but tough toenails. That is just how God set up his kingdom. And if you don't like it, you are going to have to take it up with him when you see him. If one of us is falling, we all have to grip harder on the side of the cliff because then we are all in danger. Let's just talk a little bit about sin and how it affects others. Well, you woke up now, didn't you? Now, I'm not talking about the big blatant sins that are readily apparent, like the ones that, are, that, you know, that we're glad aren't ours when we look at our neighbor's lives, <laughs> those sins. I want to take a closer, more personal look. I asked John if I could share this story for those of you who care. Well, John's father was one of the most wonderful men you would ever have met. And I mean, he was one of the good ones. He was a father to me that my dad never was. He was a devoted son, husband, brother-in-law, father, grandfather, and a devout Catholic. He could fix a rainy day, that man. He invented devices to make his tasks easier years before you could find them on the market when someone else thought of it and patented it. He was that guy, brilliant. He was also a very heavy smoker. Now, I know what you're going to say, but Pastor Sonny, isn't smoking a personal matter? How in the world can I suggest that such a personal matter, such a personal decision, would be a sin. Well, let me tell you. My father-in-law died of lung cancer brought on by a habit that he too, too thought was very, very personal. How old was, was uh, Mr. Stock when he died? 60. 60. He would have been 63. Yeah. Nine yeah. So we've all lived, we've lived 10 years longer than him. John's lived 10 years longer. I've lived, uh, you know, five, six years longer than he already did. All right. Now, as a result, of my father-in-law's very, very personal decision, my mother-in-law was left alone. She later suffered from the ravages of secondhand smoke. My husband, an only child, was left without a father, a confidant, and a best friend. My children were deprived of the only loving grandfather they had ever known, as well as myself, the only loving dad I had ever known other than the colonel. And all of it, after two years of watching the man that we all loved to death, waste away in pain and despair. That's the nature of sin. Sin is not a personal choice. Sin is not a personal matter. Sin, whether overtly or subtly, affects everyone in some way. That's just the reality of it. You may see it or you don't, but it happens. That's what makes sin sin. Sin affects all of your loved ones. Sin affects society as a whole. Now, you may be so wrapped up in yourself that you don't give a rip about that, but that also is a sin. You will never hear a prophet shout, do your own thing. Make no mistake, your own thing will lead to sadness, and it will lead to emptiness, and it will lead to despair, and it will break the hearts of the people who love you, and it will affect society as a whole. Prophets shout, do what God has told you to do. You know what that is. Do it. And then they get into trouble. Every one of them. John the Baptist did with Herod. John lost his head over it. You know when Jesus heard what had happened to John, what Herod had done to him, do you know what he said? He said, there is no man born of woman greater than John. 
I am thinking that is pretty high praise coming from the Son of God. <laughs> you know? Jesus knew John. You know, remember they were cousins. Jesus held John in the highest regard, and the respect was mutual because you know what John said about Jesus? The one who comes after me is greater than I am, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. I don't know of any other relationship quite like that in Scripture. The mutual respect, the clear understanding of what their roles were in the kingdom, the sense that they were a team, the what I do is in preparation for you and what I do is in fulfillment for you. You know, we could put it this way. Jesus said, no one born of woman is greater than John the Baptist. Listen to him. And John said, Jesus is the one who you're waiting for. Follow him. They all say the same thing. All four Gospels. They say, if you want to go to Bethlehem to see for yourself, if you want to find out who Jesus really is, you must first see John. So we might as well go. We might as well do it. John says what we would expect. He says it right off the bat. He says, repent, change your attitude, care more about what God wants for you than what your little package wants for you. That's what repentance means, you know. It doesn't mean going through life with your head down. It doesn't mean always being sad and remorseful, you know, for being so bad. It means that you just start to care more about what God wants than the shallowness of what you want. It means the start of something really good. It means, I love this part, making the past the past. It means releasing your pain and your burden to the Lord so that he can bear that burden for you. And it is a change you can feel, and it is a change that everyone can see. And suddenly you become like a speck of dust dancing in a sunbeam. And everybody wonders how the heck you got so happy. But you got to see John. And you're saying, golly, why do we have to hear this bummer of a message at Christmas? We can imagine asking John if you're brave enough. He would probably climb out of the water, and he's been in there so long, his legs are all wrinkly and blue. And he would say, you headed to Bethlehem? And we'd say, yep, yep, we're on our way there. We're going to get there in about two weeks. And then he would say, well, let me tell you what happened there. Let me tell you what's at stake. What happened there in Bethlehem is nothing less than an invasion. Not a violent one with armies, but a quiet one with love, a, a beachhead kind of for the kingdom of God. Not many people believe that because it's not what they had expected and it's for sure not what they wanted, but that's the way it happened anyway. The kingdom of God is now here. The kingdom of God is now set against the kingdoms of this world. Now you've got to choose. You've got to choose which kingdom you're going to give your loyalty to, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of this world. Are you going to give your loyalty to Herod or are you going to give your loyalty to Christ? And when you make up your mind, John tells us, then you come on out here and you see me and I'll tell you what you must do to really celebrate Christmas, to really know what the meaning of Christmas is. Well, we knew he was going to say that because he says it every Advent on this Sunday and some of us don't want to hear it. We want to hear that just because God came into this world, we can be all warm and cozy and everything can just stay the way things are. We can continue to do our own thing and to hell with everybody else. We just show up in church when it's convenient and everything's going to be okay. But John isn't going to let us get away with that. John says, God came into the world to change it. John says, God came into the world to change us. We want to hear 
that Christmas is just a good feeling. We want to hear that Christmas is just about make-believe. And we want our Christmas celebrations to be a relief from the hard facts of the world, a temporary reprieve from an epidemic. We want it to be a time of Christmas carols and good cheer and getting together and, and good food. We want, to be, we want it to have it be an escape from the real world. We want it to be like music on the elevator or mood music while we put the world on hold. But John the Baptist will not permit that. He says Christmas is nothing less than an invasion of this world by God, just like a global pandemic that you are trying to escape from. The kingdom of God has come. There are two kingdoms now, Herod and his successors and Jesus and his disciples, and you've got to make a choice between the kingdom of iron and the kingdom of love, but you have to choose. And no choice is a choice. And then John walks back into the water of the river and he says, yep, it's here all right. Kingdom of God is here right now. And he turns his head and he says over his shoulder, and you know that it's here. Denial's not gonna help you. And then he starts up the only message that he has, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. You see, the reason John is in that river every Advent, it's just in case this is the year that we want to go to Bethlehem. Just in case this is the year that we want to repent, change our attitude, and ask God to resurrect our dead souls. Ask God to cause a metamorphosis in your life. That very real feeling of being released from your burdens, to have them replaced with peace and joy and contentment, and a smile that the world can't even wipe off your face. If you're alienated from somebody, you can be reconciled. If you're self-righteous, you can be humble. If you're uncaring, you're going to be compassionate and it's going to be weird. And if you're calloused, about the world around you, you are suddenly going to find yourself caring and praying for people you barely know. If you have put your trust in the accumulation of things so that you are a slave to a whole host of masters, you will find yourself putting your trust in God. And, and if you have assumed that to this point in your life that you're going to be judged on your ability to avoid evil, Good luck with that, by the way. Christmas is a time to hear that you are going to be judged by the extent to which you had faith in Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. So John is waiting. He's waiting there until you're ready to hear what the real meaning of Christmas is. Until you are ready to see that what happened then should make a difference in what happens now. You no longer have the luxury of maintaining the status quo. You must decide. You must change. You just have to decide which way you're going to go. And when you're ready, John will be waiting. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, this is the Christmas we'd really like to go to Bethlehem. Show us the way. Amen. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him, you that truly and earnestly repent of your sins, who are in love and charity with your neighbors, who intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from this moment forward in his holy ways. Draw near with faith. And take this sacrament for your strength and your good and your comfort. Let's bow our heads as we pray together. Father 
God, you've consecrated for us a new and living way. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant to those of us who are gathered here this morning that we might so share this bread and this cup, that our hearts and our lives might be truly yielded to the sway of your Holy Spirit. Now, in accordance with our Lord's holy institution, who has commemorated the Last Supper with his disciples, and his offering of himself in the sacrifice of the cross, and we humbly pray that you would send your Holy Spirit, and that you would sanctify these creatures of bread and wine, which now we consecrate for their sacred use, so that they might become for us symbols of the body that was broken and of the blood that was shed for our salvation. And may they bring in us penitent hearts and a quickened faith, and may we receive this sacrament for our comfort and our strength and our good. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take and eat this, for this is my body that's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat, for this is the body of Christ that was broken for you. <laughs> After the same manner, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. As often as you drink this, remember me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we show the Lord's death until he comes again for us.
Take and drink, for this is the blood of Christ that was shed for our salvation. entrusted to us this memorial of your love and of your greatest gift, Jesus Christ our Lord. We humbly pray that you would strengthen in us our faith in you and that you would increase our love towards each other. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace. Please stand for the benediction. little bit of a twist. I'm going to give the benediction and then Denise will start the hymn. I'm not quite sure if she'll be here by the end, but we know how it goes. <laughs> and when you sit down, there'll be no postlude. Uh, but there's a, a brief video from Jess that we did not show, that we forgot to show at the beginning. And since it's first of the month missionary offering, that will be our postlude. Work for you, Denise. All right. Our benediction is taken from the book of Hebrews. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as we see the final day approaching. Amen.
Rich family, it's time for a new update! So I know a lot of you have been wondering or maybe even praying and curious to know what's happening in my life. An exciting new journey is happening in my life right now. My time with YWAM Butuan is coming to an end and I will be transferring to a new base. This base is YWAM Davao. YWAM Davao is a big city. I would compare it to something like Philadelphia. And so what we'll be doing there is re-pioneering that base. Over the last few years, that base has been going through a lot of um, trouble and problems and issues. Um, and it's pretty much been abandoned. The leadership has gone down. There's still five staff there, but they're all living off of base. And there's no finances for the base. The base is um, being full of snakes and termites and all kinds of living creatures. It's made itself a home for an environment of no one knows what, but um, we will be going there and re-pioneering and bringing it back to life. We have a team of nine individuals, seven from our one base and two from another base um, in the Philippines, and we'll be going there to reevaluate uh, what is needed for this base, what is the damage that's happening right now, and um, how to re repair the base to make it livable again. My plan is to start fundraising and getting the word out to what we'll be doing. The two major things that we're trying to fundraise for right now is a power washer um, because it's it's really bad. There, there's a lot of mold and all kinds of things. So a power washer and a weed whacker are two of the major things that are needed to help at least clean up the base. Um, but further further needs will be coming along as we go to that base to reevaluate. I'll um, try to take pictures to inform and just give a visual aid to what we're working with. So prayer requests are unity as a team, guidance and wisdom and we are just so excited to see what God is going to be doing throughout this journey. We're excited to see how God uses us and to see how God brings this base back to life. We're excited to see this process. So if you consider partnering with us financially, um, it's needed. <laughs> We really need a lot. And also, partner with us in prayer. That's very important. Spiritual battle is high on the need list. So continue to pray for us. Continue to partner with us. Um, and I hope to hear from you soon. I miss you guys. I appreciate everything that you're doing for me on a monthly basis. And I'm just excited for this whole journey to take start. And... So continue to pray for us as a team. Continue to pray for me, for guidance and wisdom. And another update will be coming soon on what the base is like, uh, pictures of what it looks like, what we'll be working with, and how we're going to be reconstructing it. So thank you so much for this time. I miss you guys. I love you guys. And I hope to hear from you soon. Peace.